I think we'll get started since it's two o'clock. We'll be right on time. If somebody comes a little late, that'll be fine. So I would just talk to somebody outside there and I said, uh, why don't you come on in and maybe you'll learn something. He says, what, about 10 homes? <laughs> and so uh, I guess you could call them that. They were actually steel, but. Uh, how many of you know something of the Lustron home? You A lot, and how many have not even heard of them? Okay, it's, it's all part of a prefabricated housing effort of which there were many types, and I'll talk a little bit about that too over the years, and oh ho. Hi, Joe. Okay, so we'll start off. Well, you can see a kind of a collage here that tells the story of what we might call an experiment in the use of prefabricated housing in the late 1940s. In the words of the Lustron Corporation's advertisement, their all-steel home was to be, quote, the house America has been waiting for. <laughs> Power of advertising, huh? The man shown in the upper left-hand corner had the drive and the personality that enabled him to win enough startup capital to launch a major industry. He got the first space very quickly, but waged an uphill battle in order to try for home plate. So we're going to talk about his story and tell of his legacy. Why should I be speaking about all, these all-steel homes? Well, for one thing, we have seven of them in the Iowa City area. That includes Coralville and University Heights. And I think their story, uh, the production of uh, the story of the company is kind of fascinating. One little girl called them chiclet homes. I don't, do we see chiclets anymore? Are they available? I haven't seen chiclets around for years, but. What, Joe? Oh, 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 oh. It took a while. I'm so, I, it took me a while. Well, at the end of World War II, as millions of soldiers returned home, there was a shortage of affordable housing in the United States. That's what we read, anyway. Advertisements appeared that stated a need for lumber and cheap rooms. There was a decrease in building during the Depression and during World War II that contributed to the creation of what was called the worst housing shortage America had experienced. The federal government's new housing expediter, that was a position, estimated that three million new houses were needed between 1946 and 1947. The biggest demand was for low and middle income housing. Some thought prefabricated housing was the answer, but in 1946 and 47, only about 37,000 prefab houses were constructed, representing only about five and a half percent of all the new single family housing construction. There were many housing developers at this time. One who stands out is William Levitt. He has been cited as the developer of the first modern suburb, and his development came about in 1945. He used mass production techniques to construct homes on a 4,000 acre site on Long Island, only about 25 miles from Manhattan. In less than two years, he managed to build about 17,000 homes One's as small as 800 square feet, yet with two bedrooms. Didn't he have something in, Phil in Pennsylvania as well? Was it Philadelphia area, maybe? I don't know. Looking at these Levittown houses reminds me of the 1962 song. Joe probably has sung that one, Little Boxes. It came, it became a hit for Pete Seeger in 1963. It refers to suburban housing as tracks of little boxes of different colors, all made out of ticky-tacky, and all looked this, just the same. Remember that one? Ticky-tacky referred to the shoddy building materials that were used in some of the housing developments of the day. So a, a post-World War II developer of prefabricated homes is the subject of the presentation. He was a man named Carl Strandland. You can imagine he was from Skandahubia, and he formed a company to fabricate all steel homes. He named his company the Lustron, L-U-S-T-R-O-N, Corporation. He, like Levitt, hoped to build thousands of houses, maybe 45,000 in one year. 
Carl Gunnar Strandlund was born in Sweden in 1899, came to the United States at the age of four and grew up in Moline, Illinois. Both his grandfather and his father were noted mechanical innovators. Doesn't this handsome young man look like he could be a little Dickens? Well, he was to become a little Sharpie, that's for sure. Young Carl took correspondence courses and became a self-taught engineer. He became a production engineer for Minneapolis Moline, you remember that made tractors? And while there he held over 150 farm implement patents. He's also credited with, quote, the creation of rubber tires for tractors. Later he became president of the Oliver Farm Equipment Company. Also to his credit was the invention of a machine for removing wallpaper. He was also noted for the creation of air conditioning systems for movie theaters. So before establishing this Lustron Corporation, he established an impressive set of credentials. In April of 1942, Strandland joined the Chicago Vitreous Enamel Products Company. This company produced enamel baked on steel panels that were extremely durable. That's the kind of stuff that's on our modern washing machines, clothes dryers, and other appliances. Strandland's job was to oversee the conversion of the Chicago Vitreous plant to war production. He was made the vice president and general manager of the company in 1946, making the handsome sum of $100,000 a year. These enameled steel panels were developed in the late 1920s, and during the early 30s, there were promotions that urged their more widespread adoption. At the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, known as the Century of Progress, some mostly steel prefabricated homes were on display. So when Mr. Strandland all steel homes emerged, the concept was not new. Steel enameled panels were used on the exteriors of some gas stations and hamburger stands. Bob, you were asking about that. By 1942, when the war cut off the steel supply, some 600 gas stations had been built using these panels. Well, Strandland developed a manufacturing process to build non-warping metal plates for tanks while at Chicago Vitreous, and he patented a new method for joining enameled steel panels. His innovation was based on interlocking recesses at the ends of the panels that produced a tighter seal, and later a resilient material made of polyvinyl chloride would be used to seal the joints between the panels. You think of polyvinyl chloride as hard, you know, like the PVC pipe but there's a way to make it in a flexible form by adding plasticizers. So that's what was used. If I were to offer you a short biography of Mr. Strandlet, it would read like this. He was a man who liked to party, one who liked his cigars, and one who liked to bet on the horses. He was an energetic man with a magnetic personality. Most importantly, he was a brilliant engineer with a proven track record a person who had a new vision that together with his convincing personality launched him into a big project. Well, steel remained a controlled commodity at the end of World War II. Strandland went to Washington, D.C. in June of 1946 to ask the Civilian Production Administration for an allocation of steel for commercial construction because his company wanted to resume the production of enameled panels for gas stations and other buildings. Apparently, the administ administration, quote, as much as laughed in his face when he made his request. However, when Strandland returned with a proposal to produce prefabricated housing with the steel, he generated a great deal of interest, and it was suggested that he approach the National Housing Administration. The man he had to convince was Wilson Wyatt, who was appointed by President Truman to be the housing expediter. As housing expediter, Wyatt was the head of the National Housing Administration. He became very interested in Strandland's proposal, but he needed more information before he could make a recommendation. So Strandland returned to Chicago to his company, and the owners agreed to provide $100,000 for the design of a prototype house and development of engineering, manufacturing, and marketing plans. Strandland suggested that they rename the company Lustron which was a contraction of the words luster on steel. Chicago Vitreous had used the lustron name occasionally since 1936 
and registered the trademark in 1937. Two young architects were hired and came up with a prototype design called the Lustron Esquire, which was 1,025 square feet, two bedrooms, gabled roof, bay window, and a recessed side porch. It was constructed in Hensdale, Illinois. You know where that is? It's west of Chicago. Strandland chose blue and yellow for the panels, the colors of the flag of his native Sweden. The home was designed by a Morris Beckman of the Chicago firm Beckman and Blass. It may have been loosely based on designs for the Comesto houses in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Strandland flew Wyatt to the model home and gave him a limousine ride to the site. Wyatt was impressed. Maybe with the limousine ride, I don't know. <laughs> Strandland told Wyatt that with $52 million, now that's a lot of money, he could produce 400 of these houses per day and turn out 30,000 of them in 1947. Strandland also wooed a senator, the commander of the VFW, officials from the American Legion, and the AMVET National Housing Committee. In addition to a general steel shortage after the war, there were some crippling steel, coal, and railroad strikes between 1945 and 1947. So Strandland was making his appeal during some tough times. Strandland had no money, but he had a sound idea and sound engineering. The prototype house was ready for public viewing in November of 1946. The external and internal walls of the house were metal, joined by metal studs and metal spacer plates. To provide for virtual maintenance-free service, porcelain enameled window frames, door jams, gable ends, gutters, and soffits were used. The roofing tiles were even made from porcelain enameled steel, as seen in the upper right image. The prototype was 31 by 55 feet, 900 square feet, small two-bedroom ranch, made from parts that were designed for service stations and hamburger stands. It had one and a half inches of fiberglass insulation behind the exterior panels. Doesn't sound like very much, does it? And four inches of fiberglass insulation above the false ceiling. The living room had steel walls and a steel ceiling panel system and had built-in bookshelves. Advertising declared that, quote, you get the beauty of porcelain combined with the strength and performance of steel. One of the Lustron officials was interviewed recently and he related a story. When the model homes were on display, he said someone asked him how he could hang a picture on the steel walls of the living room. The official said he really hadn't thought about it. Of course, people would find that they could use magnets. Some might even drill holes. So I'll take you through a tour of, of what the house would be like. The dining room featured a built-in cabinet for the display of, quote, your best china, adequate linen storage space, and a pass-through counter space from the kitchen. The kitchen include, included a dishwasher, clothes washer, combination, cabinets, an exhaust fan, and lighting fixtures. No stove or refrigerator were included. A novel item was the auto magic washer named Thor. Quite a selling point because very few homes even had dishwashers in 1946. The unique thing about it was that you could also wash clothes if you bought a second tub. Apparently the first Thor washing machine dated back to 1907 as the first electric clothes washer sold commercially in, in our country. Here's a kitchen configuration that includes the Thor Automagic dishwasher. The utility room included an automatic water heater and a fully automatic heating unit. The furnace was mounted near the ceiling to free up some floor space. On that right picture there, up above. The utility room included an automatic water heater and a fully automatic heating unit. The furnace unit was mounted near the ceiling. Okay, each home had a small steel plate with a model and serial number of the home, like you're buying a appliance or something. This is the master bedroom. Said you don't even need a chest of drawers with the built-in closets, dressing table, mirror cupboards, and drawers. The hall closet had room for linens. Bedroom closet had sliding doors to maximize floor living space. Pocket doors throughout the house. There's a second bedroom. Bathroom had copper, hot and cold water pipes. 
Well, by the end of 1946, Carl Strandlin had become a nationally known figure whose plans to mass produce a prefabricated porcelain enameled steel house were regularly celebrated in the media as an important part of the government's solution to the post-war housing crisis. The housing expediter whom I mentioned, Wilson Wyatt, became an advocate of the venture and he recommended the full funding of the $52 million. In fact, one source said he demanded that the Reconstruction Finance Corporation cough it up. And it, they had a total of $3 billion to work with to dole out, to loan to different entities. The RFC rejected the loan demand and Wyatt ended up re resigning out of frustration. After a long series of dealings, including testimony before a House committee, Strandlin managed to secure a loan from the RFC in June of 1947. It was for $15.5 million, far below the 52 that he wanted. But the catch was the loan was to be repaid over 78 months at 4% interest with the first payment due on January 1st of 1948. This set the stage for big trouble. Meanwhile, the owners of the Chicago Vitreous plant got cold feet and decided not to continue with the project. So Strandlin quit the company, went out on his own with a new corporation entity, the Lustron Corporation. He purchased the Lustron trademark. The details of the financing and government hearings and decisions regarding the company are complex. So I'm going to try to condense them. I don't even understand them. Well, I've read a couple of books on it. In October of 1947, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and Lustron signed a lease on a plant that Curtis Wright had used to construct warplanes. It was right by Columbus, Ohio. They had a five-year lease with an additional five-year option, but it would cost them about $430,000 a year. The Columbus plant became the largest enameling plant in the world the conveyor system was said to be nine miles long, which is hard to believe, but Lustron agreed to use union shop labor both in the factory and for on-site erection of houses. That made the AFL happy. The retooling of the factory along with its costs and production issues were to become enormous challenges. Lustron's initial hope for a factory location was outside of Chicago, but the plant went instead to the Tucker Corporation. <laughs> you remember that one? <laughs> Preston Tucker came up with an innovative design for an automobile that was perhaps ahead of its time. Did anyone remember the movie Tucker, The Man in His Dream? That was pretty neat. I, I watched that. Some parallels could probably be drawn between the two companies. During November 1947, millions of dollars worth of machinery and equipment began to arrive at the Lustron plant and they announced their intention to hire about 7,500 workers in the next year, and the company set a target to produce 100 houses per day by mid-1948, 100 a day. At that rate, the factory could turn out some 25,000 in a year, like he hoped for. The enormity of production far exceeded any previous process in the prefabricated housing industry. At full capacity, the factory would use more electricity than the entire nearby city of Columbus, Ohio. The Lustron loan received a lot of scrutiny. Strandlin had to go before a House committee and answer a lot of difficult questions. The committee remained apprehensive. In the first months of 1948, over $12 million worth of equipment arrived at the plant. In April of 1948, a Lustron model home went up in Midtown Manhattan. 40,000 toured it during the first week. And then Lustron began an advertising campaign. This is a center spread, or at least a two-page spread, in a Life magazine in 1948, said to have cost the company $50,000 for the ad. In the lower right-hand corner of the ad, see this little tiny thing right here, for people who wanted to inquire about a booklet, to get a, a free booklet. And Lustron was just inundated with requests for the booklet. In the same magazine, Lustron placed a two-page ad for the Thor Auto Magic dishwasher. Consultants recognized that over 250,000 people had responded to Lustron's initial ad 
and also that f over 4,000 had applied for dealer franchises. The consultant's report advised the RFC to make an additional loan of $10 million. The second loan was granted, and that raised the indebtedness to $25,500,000. The second loan by itself called for a monthly payment of $1,250,000. This placed an enormous amount of pressure on Lustron, but it was declared that this money was needed to complete the startup procedures and purchase the equipment that was needed. By early 1949, Lustron had gained provisional approval from the FHA to loan money for Lustron house buyers, and the company had secured contracts for some 7,000 houses. However, by that time, Lustron raised the price of its house, making it begin to creep out of the middle markets, so necessary to sustain plant capacity. The first house for public sale left the plant in January of 1949. In February of 1949, the RFC granted a third loan, for, this time for $7 million, which raised the indebtedness of the corporation to $32.5 million. Lustron was now producing 15 houses per day. This is far below the previous target of 100 houses per day. So how was a Lustron home built? Let's go on to that a little bit. Lustron contracted to have specially built trucks that cost them an arm and a leg. That was another bad move as far as what they could pay off. But the whole, one whole house would come on one truck to each building site. The parts were put on the truck in reverse order so that each part would come off in the order that it would be set into place. Here's a picture showing all of the parts that went into a Lestron home, some 3,000 without showing the tiny parts like nuts, bolts, and washers. Consumer Reports gave a thumbs up to the home, Lustron, when it compared it to two other small homes in a Consumer Reports. They called it a Best Buy and said, Lustron gives you most for your money. Three months after the encouraging Consumer Reports endorsement, Lustron ran some color ads in the Saturday Evening Post. Here's one a month later. A few months later, January of 1949, an ad promoted the heating system in the ceiling. Some of you might laugh at that. They described it as working by radiating down in a luxurious manner. <laughs> Critics have wondered how this could work since heat rises, but apparently it worked pretty well, except perhaps in the coldest climates. More model homes were constructed in Milwaukee, St. Louis, Des Moines, Detroit, Miami, Minneapolis, many places. Here are the floor plans of the two and three bedroom Westchester models and of the two and three bedroom Newports and other models would follow. Not very big. I can't tell you how they varied in price or how many of each were produced, but the Newports were smaller than Westchester's. The original pricing of the Lustron home was, to, was set to compete favorably with comparable so-called stick-built homes. A range of pricing may have been six to $10,000, but there was quite a variance because of local lot prices, local market conditions, and the escalation of base prices as Lustron made adjustments. They did put out a manual that was used by each local construction crew. They used local crews. They didn't have their own crews. The first construction step was to pour a concrete slab. Almost all the homes were without basements. The floors then were covered with one eighth inch asphalt tile, one eighth inch thick. They used private local contractors and local dealer franchises, creating a number of problems. The company originally set their price to be very favorable, but a number of variables kept the pricing inconsistent. Land prices, price of labor in different locales, building codes, and dealers were expected to pay the full cost of materials up front, which created cash flow, prob flow, flow problems for them. The channels have been bolted down to the concrete, and the sidewall frames with their integral windows have been installed. Two of the construction crew members are seen carrying a roof truss. Now the dining room window, the kitchen floor, living room door, rear bedroom window, and the living room bay window have been placed. 
the construction crew has placed a poster for America's family home in the front window. The roof trusses have now been installed, tied together. The roof tiles have been installed. The exterior has been completed in less than a week. The interior lacks only a few details for it to be ready for occupancy. It was supposed to be completed in 360 man hours. And I don't know how long that would be with, depending on the crew size, but they could probably put them up in as little time as a week or two. A design element common in each house was the zigzag downspout trellis combination as a little touch. From January of 1949 to the summer of 1949, they secured contracts for or agreements to build almost 9,000 homes in a lot of places around the country. Could the tide finally be turning for Lustron? In January of 1949, Strandland announced that the company would reach its break-even point of 1,000 units per month and would achieve its target production of 3,000 units per month within the year of 1949. But sadly, only a month after that, Lustron laid off 800 workers, and by mid-1949, dealers had become increasingly frustrated. This is a Time Magazine article in 1949 titled, Bathtub Blues. Senator Fulbright was quoted as asking if people really wanted to live in steel houses. He said, I have only seen one of them, but it sort of reminds you of a bathtub. <laughs> Even the RFC director was quoted as saying they looked a little like hot dog stands. The Time article posed the question, how long will the RFC keep pouring millions into Lustron? The RFC director indicated that it would be until everyone is satisfied that Lustron will either be a success or a flop. Time concluded their story was so far it has been far from a success. It wasn't good news. On July 7th of 1949, 24 houses were shipped from the factory. That was the largest single day. But remember, he was hoping for 100 per day by then. So in July of 1949, the fourth and fifth loans came in. But the catch was each was due in 60 days. One account described them as suicide loans because they would be impossible to repay, but they would make it easy for their RFC to foreclose. So with a little glimmer of hope, on July 31st of 1949, Lustron shipped 42 houses from the factory, the largest single-day shipment to date. In August of 1949, the RFC made two more loans this time for $1 million and $2 million. And again, they were due in just 60 days. The total indebtedness to Lustron was now $37.5 million. By now, Lustron realized that its long-term survival depended upon innovative solutions to complex problems involving marketing and dealer relations. By September of 1949, things were starting to go downhill fast. And that month, the company laid off half of its sales force leaving only 14 salespersons. By October, seven vice presidents and three directors had resigned. In October, the factory line slowed to produce only six homes a day, and Lustron laid off over 2,000 employees, leaving barely 1,000 from a high of 3,400 only four months before. In late December, the RFC terminated its loans to the corporation and issued an ultimatum to submit a plan of reorganization by January 6th. Apparently, Strandland casually replied by letter only an hour before the deadline. On February 14th of 1950, the RFC ordered foreclosure proceedings to be started. The last house was shipped on June 6th of 1950. On March 27th of 1951, President Truman ordered the transfer of the Lustron plant to the Department of Navy to return the facility to aircraft production. The man seated in the desk was preparing to assign the plant to the United States Navy. Ironically, the plant that previously produced naval aircraft for World War II would soon be producing naval aircraft for the Korean War. Altogether, 2,680 Lustron homes had been erected. That represents an estimated $15 million gross proceeds for Lustron, a very small sum. The table shows the month, number of homes built and shipped month by month. Where, the, where were they built? Well, looking at the United States map, I 
kind of plotted them out, we can see that most of the homes went up in the states east of the Mississippi River. Higher shipping rates coupled with the difficulty of getting heavy trucks over the Rocky Mountains left no lustrons in the western states. Largest number was built in Illinois, with the largest concentration of them in Lombard near Chicago. There were nearly 130 constructed in Lombard. Ohio, Indiana, and Iowa also received a substantial number. Some 60 were erected at the Quantico Marine Corps base in Virginia, but all but two were demolished starting in 2005. They were deemed to be just too small for today's Marine families. And a couple of people took them up on buying them and dismantling them and erecting them someplace else. But Okay, now let's turn to them in our area here in Iowa City. This home's on East Court Street, south of City High, about where Morningside Drive comes in the court. Garages that were built for the Lestrons generally had wood frame structures. This is the one on Third Avenue near you, Bob, in Iowa City. These are side-by-side -side ones on Clark Street. I met the people who live in the one on the left. I'll offer some comments about their home in a moment. This historical sign is one of seven that have been placed in the Longfellow neighborhood. Talks about the Lustron Corporation. This one's in Coralville on 11th Avenue. And University Heights, there's one. And this is the one that's across from Kinnick Stadium. What's different about that? Yeah, looks like they recited it with Maybe aluminum or, or vinyl, whatever, yeah. Steel, maybe steel. Keep it all steel. During recent years, the Lustrons have been given some press whereby current owners have expressed their satisfaction with them. I found a couple, well, more than a couple, but uh, this is one where they put two together and made one, one larger one. And this is kind of interesting, a little hard to read, but it was... It's an ad for one in La Crosse, Wisconsin that they rent out for 115 to 150 a night. That's a few years ago's price anyway. Probably be nostalgic for some people who've maybe lived in one once. I met the family then, they were called the Hills, Hillis, H-I-L-L-I-S. They either still lived there or did, and on Clark Street, the lady bought the home from her father in about 2002. Most of the windows are original, giving them 70, or 65 years of service. In the kitchen, we see the original vent fan, metal cabinet on the right, and probably the original sink. Time has taken its toll on the kitchen cabinet drawers with some rust, but most of the drawers still open and close very smoothly, and they don't even have roller bearings. Time's also kind of taken its toll on the bathroom panels. The steel panels on the ceiling are four foot square, as opposed to two foot squares on the exterior. You see they have vertical panels on the, on the walls inside. The rods on the rear of the utility room act as adjusters for the heating system. They said it worked pretty well for them, for the heating there. Found the, the oval plate as expected with the serial number and model number. The metal plates on the rear of the home has been in comp compromised in their integrity a little bit. We took one off to look at it. You can see the, the seal material here that might be that soft polyvinyl chloride. The roof is all original, steel enameled plates. There's a chip in one of the rear panels. You can see that the porcelain layer had pretty good thickness to it. A previous owner painted their panels, which was a no-no because they found that paint would not hold well to enamelize Lustron surfaces. So why did Lustron go out of business? Let me hear your thoughts based upon what I've told you. Too much debt. Too much debt. Could be. I'm not sure I ran across that in an analysis of things. I may have had that coming up. I've got about 13 possible causes coming up. That's, that's a good thought. 
Right. You just, uh, and why didn't they, I guess is the question, huh? Let's explore that a little bit. First of all, this is a video from 2002 that paints a rather convincing picture of government corruption that led to the demise of Lustron. I don't know if that's a good statement, but let's say the government had an, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. I'm not convinced that what it portrays is all correct after my reading in these other books, but they, I think they broadcast it on PBS. Did anybody see that? Been a number of years ago. But anyway, according to the writers, the last series of loans granted to Lustron, being short-term ones of only 60 days, made it impossible to repay that led to an easy foreclosure. They said high-level people within the RFC were trying to force their way into the top management of Lustron. For a few key people in and around the RFC, there was a chance to grab a company that could make them rich. Strandland was pressured into putting one of the RFC people into a token upper management position and used this man as a liaison or lobbyist in Washington. Later, Strandland would be pressured to incorporate more RFC officials into the corporation. An RFC directive came down ordering Strandland to turn his controlling shares of Lustron stock over to an RFC insider. That's what came out here. The video pointed its most incriminating finger at the Democratic National Committee by stating that if Strandland got a phone call, that Str stating that Strandland got a phone call from the committee demanding that he cough up a $100,000 contribution or Lustron would be closed down. And Strandland, Strandland refused. A number of former officials of Lustron, as well as the one-time director of the RFC, who had advocated for Lustron, were interviewed in the video. So why did it fail? These might be hard to read, but I'll read them for you. They're not necessarily in order of importance. The amount of capitalization required was enormous, and the government got tired of the high value of the loans and the fact that they were unable to make payments. Well, sure. There were cost overruns, which drove the prices up to the high end of affordability for most. The price and logistics of transportation were problematic. Retooling the former aircraft factory was slow to come about. There was adverse publicity. Congressional investigations contributed to the demise. Lustron demanded full payment to the dealers, so they had a cash flow problem with that. Banks were reluctant to give mortgages in many cases, although the FHA did approve. The inherent design of the first Lustrons did not lend itself to efficient mass production, and Lustron therefore faced the resulting bad consequences. Timing and price issues caught up with them. Lustron missed a window of opportunity, and they also could not guarantee a fixed nationwide price due to all those fluctuations. So, Dealers were frustrated by delays in flexibility, philosophical differences, missing parts, wrong plans, damaged parts, a lot of different things. Attitudes of some against prefabricated housing as cheap and temporary. And the company dealer relationship was ill conceived and very problematic. And maybe, as you said, campaigning with this, by the stick built people. This is a, one of my sources. In the back of the book, the author lists all of the known lustrons, their model numbers, serial numbers, and locations. This is another one. It goes into great deal concern, detail concerning the background of the housing industry and societal issues. He's also very detailed in describing the events concerning the fall of Lustron and the video that I referred to. So from all indications, the Lustron homes are quality built homes, products of well thought out engineering. Strandland, always the man of confidence and great ability, was willing to adjust his product line to the public's taste and to market forces. He planned to produce homes with air conditioning. He even planned on homes with electric windows and sliding walls to open up the living quarters. To quote him, quality is when you are having people for cocktails and you push a button and the wall slides open. Of the 2,680 or so that were built, it's estimated only about 1,200 to 1,500 remain. That's quite a few. Many lustrons are on the National Register of Historic Places, which is basically an official list of cultural resources worthy of preservation. And as a final note, 
Strandlin was to live on for over 20 more years. His wife says he was never the same and died a quote unquote broken man at age 75. Eight years after his death, his widow Clara related that the closure of Lustron left him physically and mentally destroyed. She said, everything we had went. They took everything but our home. As an addendum, I'd like to make a few comments about earlier prefab housing in the United States. Between 1902 and 1920, there were a number of companies offering kit homes. You remember reading about those like the Sears home? It was a big distributor. There are examples of their kit homes in Iowa City. Other companies were Wardway Homes from Montgomery Ward, Aladdin, Bennett, Gordon Van Tyne, just to name some of them. Some of them lasted into the 1970s or just beyond. And I'm not talking about modular homes where entire walls came out of the factory, but where each board, numbered or labeled, was in the kit. In other words, every piece had to be put together. Other names for kit homes were mill cut houses, pre-cut houses, ready-cut houses, mail-order homes, and catalog homes. The Sears home here is quite sizable. I don't know. It wasn't here. But I just picked it off of Google Images. Just as an entire Lustron home was conveyed via one truck, a kit home might have been loaded onto one or more boxcars for conveyance to their building sites. And lastly, there was a man named Howard T. Fisher who patented a construction system before Strandlin introduced the Lustron. He used pressed steel panels for walls. I don't think they were enameled steel, but steel. Roofs and floors. Once the foundation was poured like Strandlin, he used local crews to put a house together in as little as one or two weeks. Here's a drawing of the steel house that Fisher exhibited at the Chicago World's Fair in 1934. So there were some, some things that preceded Carl Strandlin and his work. So there you have it. Thank you. How many would like to live in a Lustron home? <laughs> would you? <laughs>